don't care, dude. What are you here for tonight? Wait a minute. Hmm? Hold on here. Oh, you already got. There's not. I think it's just this one and this one. I don't see it. Oh, there it is. Don't you scare me, Curtis. I'll scare you. I'll scare you. <laughs> cool. So is it sliding or is it? Okay. You can slide. You can tap. Tapping's not working. Slide. What about pointing? What are we using? We're we using a laser now. We don't have one. Somebody took the green one. The other green one was up there. You want me to grab the one up there? You need. You need to use it. Maybe, but I don't know. Let's see. Let's see. I had one of my own, but yeah, that doesn't work. In case they need me to point, I don't know. I'll borrow it from them. All right. Thanks, dude. Works like a charm. All right. We'll go ahead and get this meeting um, started. We want to welcome you to the Planning Commission meeting of Wednesday, April 2nd, 2014. Can I get a roll call, please? Chairman Jennifer Whitman. Here. Vice Chairman Joshua Ayler. Here. Commissioner David Blazer. Here. Commissioner Carl Bloomfield. Here. Commissioner David Cavaney. Commissioner Bridget Peterson. Here. Commissioner Christopher Sipple. Alternate Kyle Powell. Here. All right, thank you very much. Uh, moving on to agenda item number seven, can I get an approval of the agenda, Vice Chairman? Yes, uh, I'd like to make a motion to move a few items around on the agenda. I'd like to move uh, item number 13, 14, UP 1402 to the non-consent agenda, and then move item number 15, which is GP 1403, and item 16, which is Z14-05 to the consent agenda. All right, with that, do I have a motion? Second. Oh, you want to? Do I, oh, yeah, you, that, that was your motion. I'm yes. sorry. Second. In a second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Passes unanimously. All right, moving on to agenda item number eight, which is communications from citizens. At this time, members of the public may comment on matters not on the agenda. The commission's response is limited to the responding to criticism, asking staff to review a matter commented upon, or asking that a matter be put on a future agenda. Is there anyone here wishing to speak under those circumstances? If you could um, come up one at a time and um, state your name for the record. Chair Whitman and members of the commission, my name is Amy Peterson. I'm a resident of Gilbert. Obviously, the, your discussion and your study session has brought up a lot of issues that we wanted to address, and we're grateful for that and your research and time and, and consideration on this very, in our minds, very serious issue. I feel like we need a little Reader's Digest version of the history of why this issue is, is a big issue. There was a company, Springstone Saguaro, who was an out-of-state nonprofit behavioral health hospital. It was not a behavioral or a banner health wing. It was nothing. We cannot compare it to a regular hospital, as Commissioner Powell stated. Uh, to, we can't compare the two. They're completely separate. So, so to address Commissioner Blazer's concern about when you're, you go into these hospitals and it's completely secure, that's, we can't compare that to what Springstone Saguaro was trying to bring. They were going to locate in the vacant parcel on Quinn and Baseline next door to Pioneer Elementary School. It was 75 feet away from our four-foot chain-linked fence playground with all of our children there. And as you know, by right, they were allowed to do this. So it was a big deal. Um, 
I too did all of my research as the staff has done. I called all of the, the police departments that responded to all of the behavioral health hospitals that Springstone owns and operates in other states. I have all of the police reports. I actually have them here with me. So, you know, to hear, when I hear numbers, well, they're, you know, that's, it's not this, there's not a higher rate of calls out to these hospitals than behavioral health. I think we need to re look at some of these, you know, report of escape of a, pa a patient, he's schizophrenic, homicidal and suicidal thoughts, threw a, a chair through a window to escape. They found him in a, ch in a tree a half a mile up the street. I mean, I have stacks of these reports and that's what we were talking about putting next to an elementary school. So yes, I think that we do need greater security buffers for these types of facilities and they absolutely need to be specified in their own class. A behavioral health hospital is separate from a hospital. Um, if we, do, if we can't protect ourselves before these, these businesses come in, we have no control. Just as we learned in that situation, nobody thought it was a good idea. I sat at these meetings with town council, nobody thought it was a good idea, but everyone's hands were tied. And so that's why we're here, trying to get these changes made. And a use permit is much better than the recommendation that, was, that came last month to you all to, you know, let's just keep it how it is and move forward and include behavioral health hospitals and, and basically allow what we just so, fought so hard to stop but it's not enough. I, I believe I am, Commissioner Powell took all of the words out of my mouth, so I feel a little bit unprepared today because we absolutely have to have a separation distance. We absolutely have to. In every instance, this is never gonna be a good idea. It's never gonna be a good idea if a behavioral health hospital, specifically one that is for profit, out of state, because what motive and incentives do they have? They don't have the interest of our community and, our, and their patients, their, their interest is to their shareholders. And they're gonna try to locate next to a school or a park or a daycare, that's never gonna be a good idea. So why is that a bad idea to put in always a separation distance? It, it just has to be there in our opinion. And, and I, I will continue to push for that. Um, then I also, I, I want to a, agree with the idea of the special use permit because at that point I think that you guys have a lot of really serious questions to ask and I'm going to give some of these questions and these came from Randy Gray. He is the president and CEO of Mark which is the largest behavioral health hospital. It's a nonprofit serving over 9,000 people here in the East Valley. He is, works very closely on this. He gave me my, his permission to give you all his cell phone number if you want to talk to him, if you want to get any research. He's, he's great and he has 40 years experience in this. He's at the legislature tonight or he said he would be here. But he said some of the questions are, do you distinguish between inpatient and outpatient? Do you have a closed and locked wing? Do you take court adjudicated patients? Do you treat both patients with psychosis and neurosis? Do you admit patients who have been diagnosed by a psychiatrist as a danger to themselves or to others? And then, as he said, I mean, he brings up a point a lot about the, the for-profit. We, we have to be asking these kinds of questions. So those use permits are a great idea because we absolutely have to play, play it case by case. This is a, not a one-size-fits-all. We cannot be, you know, th these, these, this research is great and valiant effort on all of the time spent on it, but we're not comparing apples to apples when we're talking about something like a Springstone and something like a banner. It, they're just not. Um, I also wanted to bring up the point and that I, this has nothing to do with being opposed to mental health hospitals. We absolutely support it. I absolutely believe there's a need for it. And as Randy told me today, I was unaware of the statistic, but MMIC, which is Mercy Maricopa Integrated Care, it's a nonprofit here in Maricopa County that has the contract for all of Maricopa. It's a $1.2 billion a year contract, and it's three years. That's a lot of money. That's absolutely, there is appropriate money efforts going into this. Nobody's here saying we don't want it. We are just saying we have to have to protect this, this population. So in closing, I would just like to state that I, I agree with everything Commissioner Powell said. I would like to see behavioral health hospitals have their own special use definition separate. Then they need a special use permit. Then they need a separation buffer. In, in my mind, that's anything less is unacceptable. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ms. Peterson. We appreciate it. If you could give your name for the record and city of residence. Hi, Madam Chairman and Commissioners. My name is Christine Levitt, and I do live here in Gilbert. 
Um, you know, as Amy kind of brought up, I got involved in this about a year ago when we had Saguaro Springs that was planning to be built next to the elementary school. And that's when I researched these behavioral health facilities a little bit myself and saw that there is a big difference between facilities and between what can come in under this behavioral health type definition. Um, what we had that was proposed to be built, for example, was between a 70 and 100 bed um, mental type institution that would take anyone, you know, from depression to panic attacks, hallucinations, um, sexual impulse control disorder. Um, and there was also an outpatient methadone clinic that was going to be built as part of this. And I know you guys mentioned the sober homes that um, you guys had to discuss. And I imagine if you thought about how an outpatient methadone clinic would be with, you know, no limits as to the number of patients being treated, you can see that this might create a problem with people congregating, um, you know, in this in the parking lots, as is the case in the current Mesa psychiatric hospitals, as well as, you know, around the canal area that was here or the school that was right next door. Um, and one of the big things here, too, is that we have these for-profit institutions that can come in under this behavioral health type facility. And once you have this for-profit, again, it's answering to shareholders. Um, they've found that lots of these institutions may have a lack of oversight. The Arizona Department of Health Services is not responsible at all for the clinical operations. And um, the, as I say, the decisions are made. What's the best interest of the shareholder? What's going to bring the most money? Money. And um, a couple years ago in Kingman, there was this for-profit prison, for example, and there were some escapees, and they killed three residents of the city. And then all of a sudden, they realized, oh, they didn't have adequate supervision ratios, and so they, you know, got cited for that. But unfortunately, that happened after the incident. There's not this sort of maintenance in these facilities to ensure that there will be proper supervision, that there will be proper licensing for the staff, that there will be proper security guards or whatever else they need in, in these type of facilities. And granted, it is a liability, but it's one where you don't want one mistake. Um, and then, you know, you have this conditional use permit that you were discussing about, and you were saying that, you know, you could have this where you would be able to mitigate the impact, and I'd hope it would be one where you would be able to deny the use entirely as well. But um, just to kind of explain kind of what we had, we, when we were dealing with this institution, we called this Dan Burline that was the one that had been the liaison from the hospital to the city council working on developing this. And he had been completely dishonest. He had said, oh, we have never had any of our patients escape. That's what he told the city council. Well, we pulled the incident reports, and <laughs> there's been multiple patients escaping from every single one of their facilities. Um, you know, he, he told the, us, oh, it's primarily geriatric. Well, when, you know, one of us called and said, hey, we have this, you know, sexual impulse, you know, we, we really like young children and have this sexual disorder. Oh, yeah, we would be able to be admitted to that facility, they told us when they called. So there was a complete lack of honesty that went down between the heads of this institution and, and what was actually going in. And so as a citizen, I'm just entirely concerned that, you know, even with this conditional use permit, uh, how are you going to verify that, you know, that it really is what it's going to say it is. I mean, once it's able to get in, once, you know, these basic criteria are met, you can do a lot more if you want, you know, I mean, because over time things can change and maybe, you know, first they won't open a wing that they say they won't, but unless it's actually, you know, barred from that, I mean, it, it just is a slippery slope and, it, and it's, again, it's it just a dangerous thing and um, mental health is something that absolutely does need to be addressed by this community and we, and a facility should be built, but the concern is just where that facility should be built. And I, I really hope that you will consider, um, you know, I, I like the idea about the safety buffer and barrier zones, um, you know, to, to have that. And, and I don't know whether a park is necessary. I mean, having an outpatient methadone clinic next to a park, that does raise a concern to me. Um, but for sure next to schools, daycares, I mean, that seems like that's kind of a no-brainer that we don't necessarily want these facilities.
Um, and so I guess basically I just really do hope that you take into consideration that this needs to be something that's done in the zoning. Um, when this facility was going to be built, when we came to try to oppose it, we were having to, uh, to oppose the architectural plan. I mean, it was already going to go through. There was nothing that we could do to keep the facility from being built. Um, all we could do is say, we'll put up a little higher wall, even though we have these incident reports where they're climbing walls, climbing trees. You know, we have people even with a gun that they picked up at one of the institutes. So, I mean, it, it's just one of those things where this needs to be taken care of in zoning, and this needs to be something that doesn't even get to the point where all of a sudden it's going to be built, and there's the only thing we can do is say, we'll put up a little higher wall or something. This is something that needs to be taken care of at the level um, as far as these, these zoning you know, barriers, these safety zones, and, and I think that's very important for these behavioral institutions. Um, thank you for your time. Thank you, Christine. Good evening, I'm Christina Bradley. I'm just gonna make this short and sweet because I absolutely 100% agree with everything that Christine Levitt and Amy Peterson has said. I was involved in the second fight against Saguaro Springs. Um, we uncovered a significant amount of prior circumstances and legal actions against the CEO and owners of that place. The honesty wasn't there. Um, my biggest problem is we cannot, once it gets to that point, fight them any harder than we fought before. And we were lucky that they pulled out, in my opinion, because they were dirty, they weren't honest, they didn't give us any answers, they were willing to put nothing on paper. So I support the buffers, the special use permit, because we do need mental health. Security is so important around here, and um, if we could pick places like Banner Health over a, a shady company that is going to take advantage of our town. It just makes sense that you guys have that, that power right now to, to protect our town. Thank you. Thank you, Christina. You could give your name and city of residence for the record. Sure. My name is Patricia Baker, and I am a resident of Gilbert. Um, basically, I'm really just here to kind of correct some of the math that we've got going on. Um, I'm not really a numbers person. But I made a couple phone, well, actually I made all of one phone call today to, to kind of check some of the numbers. And I wanted to compare the Banner Gateway numbers on this. They actually said that according to this report, Banner Gateway has 177 beds, okay? And on its worst month, it had 23 instances. And by looking at that, that looks bad, doesn't it? But when you actually consider it, I made a call to Banner Gateway, and I said, you know what, how many patients do you see just in your ER each month? Banner Gateway sees 5,000 patients in its ER each month. The lady was very nice to go look that figure up for me. That's just their ER. That's not their inpatient, that's not their maternity ward, that's not their outpatient, that's nothing else on them. That's just their ER, 5,000 patients. So your real numbers here, if we do the math on that, and like I said, I'm not a math person, but, but just a real quick math on that, instead of the 9.2% rate of bed rate per patient or per incident is 9.2 according to your math, it's actually 0.0046%. That is less than five instances for every, what is that, less than five instances per every thousand patients they see, okay? Now that's what, uh, one instance every 215-ish, right? All right, so now if we compare that to Springstone's best rate that they gave you, their best rate, best rate that they gave you was one instance per every 20 patients, okay? One instance per every 20. So if we had a facility the size of Banner that dealt with the clientele of Springstone, that would be 250 instances per month, per month, okay? 250 police called out to them per month if they were the same size as a banner. So numbers, like I said, I'm not really a numbers person, but I can tell you your numbers are bad. <laughs> this is basically like we're saying that I should drive a four-wheeler down the freeway because there are far less accidents on four-wheelers than there are on cars. That's basically the comparison you're making here. It is not, this is not apples to apples here. This is apples to, to elephants, basically. 
Um, <laughs> that we're not even in the same category of, of thing. And, and I'm with them on this. I, we absolutely need good mental health care, but we need to look at the numbers realistically. We don't need to put rose-colored glasses on things. We need to make comparisons to hospitals that are of the same variety that they are. If we wanted to make a comparison between the incident reports of a Springstone and the incident reports of a other type of inpatient hospital, it would be closer to comparing something like, like the, um, what is it, the Arizona Spine and Joint Institute. I'd be willing to bet if you look at their incident reports, they have an average of zero police calls per month. And that's what our hospitals that we want in these commercial zones that are next to schools and things. If you want to put a hospital there, by all means. But let's put a hospital that is like an Arizona joint hospital, which will have zero police calls, not a hospital like a Springstone, where we're going to end up with you know, an untold number of calls based on that. We really do have to really guard our children on these things. It's not an issue for, it's, it's not an issue that is a theoretical issue. We dealt with this last year. It's, to us, it's not, it's not just a passing thing. We're not going to just you know, fade away next month and not be here again if it comes back up again. We'll be here every single time it comes up. Um, this group of moms is, is dedicated. And you're only seeing a teeny little portion of us this time around because we basically got out the word like yesterday. So you know, we filled this chamber before with our concerned parents. And we can do it again if we need to, to, to kind of make sure that it doesn't happen. But to be quite honest, I really think based on the information that I've heard this evening that that y'all have it under control and that you're gonna make the right decision. And the right decision in this case really is to define them separately and to make sure that there is a barrier between them and especially schools. That's our big thing, especially schools, daycares, anything that deals with little ones. That's what we're here to protect. You see my little associate over there who's been making noise the whole time that, <laughs> that we've been in this place. He's my concern. He's 100% of my concern. Well, him and his brothers. He has five other ones just like him. So, <laughs> But anyway, thank you for your time. Thank you, Patricia. Is there anybody else here wishing to speak on this matter under communications? I don't see anybody, but thank you. We appreciate your comments. Of course, uh, we're restricted from commenting upon them, but we'll have staff look into it. And this case will be back before us next month. And so we will, um, I'm sure, see you then. Thank you. Okay, moving on to um, the public hearing consent. Consent public hearing items will be heard at one public hearing. After the consent public hearing, these items may be approved by a single motion. At the request of a member of the commission or staff, an item may be removed from consent calendar and may be heard and acted upon separately. Other items on the agenda may be added to the consent public hearing and approved under a single motion. At this time, we have agenda item number nine, which is S13-14, it's a request to approve a preliminary plat and open space plan for the bungalows at Cooley Station by Woodside Homes. We have agenda item number 10, which is S14-01, it's a request to approve a preliminary plat and open space plan for Spectrum at Val Vista Parcel 16 for 14 home lots. Um, agenda item number 11, which is UP 13-24, and that's a request to approve a conditional use permit for a Dunkin' Donuts uh, located generally at the southeast corner of Higley and Ray Roads. Agenda item number 12, which is UP 14-01, it's a request to approve a conditional use permit for approximately 0 0.3 of an acre um, located south of the southwest corner to permit a wireless communication facility. Uh, agenda item number 15, which is GP 14-03, and that's a request for a minor general plan amendment um, to change the land use classification. And I think we have, sorry, land use classifications um, for uh, property generally located Chandler, uh, Chandler Heights and east of Greenfield Road from residential two to three and a half um, and to parks retention, which I think it's actually SF43, or is the general plan not changing? Um, parks retention to residential two to 3.5. Um, and then case Z, agenda item number 16, which is case Z14-05, it's a request to rezone approximately 0.93 acres, which is the companion zoning case to the last case of real property um, located generally in this, uh, north of Chandler Heights Road and east of Greenfield um, from Maricopa County Rule 43 um, to single family to SF 43. 
So with that, um, I'll open the public hearing. Is there anybody here wishing to speak on any of these items? I don't have any cards up here at this time. Okay, with that, I'll go ahead and close the public hearing and bring it back to the dais. Is there discussion or possible motion? Chairman? Commissioner? I'll go ahead and make a motion based on everything that you just presented um, for the agenda with the revised staff recommendations for cases um, 15 and 16 that were presented to us tonight. Okay, I have a motion by Commissioner Peterson. Do I have a second? Second. I have a second by uh, Vice Chairman Ayler. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Passes unanimously. Moving on to the public hearing non-consent portion of our agenda. The non-consent public hearing items will be heard at an individual public hearing and will be acted upon by the commission by a separate motion. During the public hearings, anyone wishing to comment in support of or opposition to a public hearing item may do so. If you wish to comment on a public hearing item, you must fill out a public comment form. They're located in the back of the room, indicating the item in which you would wish to be heard. Once the meeting is closed, there will be no further public comment unless requested by a member of the commission. With that, um, our first item up on the agenda would be UP case number 13, which is UP 14-02. That's Classics and Fine Arts High School. It's a request to approve a conditional use permit for approximately 7.1 acres of property located at the southeast corner of Wrecker and Warner to allow a school, public or private, large-scale use in the community commercial zoning district with the PAD. And with that, we'll invite up Mr. Nathan Williams. Thank you, Madam Chair, members of the Planning Commission. Um, I could go through a presentation or if you just had questions on it, whatever you prefer, just let me know. I think unless um, any of the other commissioners feel so, that, we, that maybe we could just address a few questions that we may have as a group. Is there anybody who has questions that they would like to address with staff? I, get, I guess my first question, Nathan, was, Considering this is a charter school and the size that it is, how come we haven't seen this case before tonight? I, I was kind of surprised that we didn't at least see a study session or something for a charter school, for a new school. Maybe you could explain that to me so that we know for the future. Sure. Uh, Chairman Irving, uh, Commissioner Peterson. Well, the reason we didn't bring this forward was because, um, number one, we this is similar. The, the same entity had a charter school approved on the southwest corner about a year ago. This is their high school uh, um, you know, aspect of it, nine through 12. Um, so, you know, charter schools, as you know, they're not, the only, you know, this is required to go through a use permit because it's in community commercial. However, um, it is a, a use by right with the use permit. That said, always the main issues are traffic, circulation, access. Um, we worked really well with the applicant, our traffic engineer. We have an approved traffic impact analysis. Um, no concerns from staff on it, no concerns from traffic engineering on it. It's pretty straightforward and, and simple, so we felt like it was a very good use for the property. Okay. Based on that, the, a couple of the staff recommendations. Number two, the Classics and Fine Arts High School shall submit a letter prior to the start of the school year that updates any changes to the traffic and circulation plan for the subject site. Who keeps track of that in the future? I believe our tra town traffic engineer does. They're, they're the traffic engineering division. So at so the beginning of the year, they'd know that if they hadn't received something from the school, that they'd need to follow up on that each year? That's correct. And then it says once the um, point number four, or uh, recommendation number four is um, once the school has enrollment of greater than 500 students, the school will annually report to the town of Gilbert about the number of students utilizing both private vehicles and bus provided by the school. Um, what happens when they get to that point and if it's too many? Then what do we do? Because traffic circulation is an issue with every school. I mean, we know it is. Mr. Peterson, that, that's correct. Um, it is. And the reason that this condition was in there, that was crafted with us, uh, planning, traffic engineering, the applicant. Um, the reason this site works is because the applicant has noted that buses were going to be a large part of this circulation plan. Um, you can see this purple here is where the buses will enter the site and drop off. Mm -hmm. um, so the applicant estimates of an 800 student school, about 300 at the build out are going to be bused to the school, leaving 500 to be driven by vehicles. The town traffic engineer wanted some level of security, teeth, what have you, to control if something like that did happen. Um, if that does happen, they're going to have to submit a new traffic impact analysis. 
which just to like in this case, we have a use permit for the, for the property. However, they still have to have an approved traffic impact analysis. And that's the teeth. It wouldn't necessarily have to, well, it could potentially have to come back to you if, if it violated that condition okay. or it didn't have an approved traffic impact analysis that the town traffic engineer approved. So, you know, that's why we put it in there. Um, and the traffic engineering division is the one who manages that as well. And how many parking spaces are provided? I'm trying to scan back through 203. my... 230. 203. So you expect 500 students to be dropped off by vehicle, potentially more than half of them driving themselves, since I live across the street from a high school. That's the parking spaces right there without staff. Commissioner Peterson, that is the, the applicant actually, well, I'll just, the, the parking standards for a school, a high school, are seven per classroom. They have 29 classrooms, so they're right on their, the land development code's okay. uh, requirement. There's nothing we could do about that. Okay. Additionally, schools are exempt from certain development standards. Um, it's debatable whether parking's one of them, but they actually meet their parking requirements, so, so there's they, very little we can, okay. yeah. They meet it at this time, and yeah. hopefully it's enough. Well, and I, it's unlikely our... that I mean, we could have the applicant come up and kind of give estimates in terms of who, what kids will drive, what limitations the school places on kids that drive, how many parents will probably drop them off, and there won't be a car there, a vehicle there. So, um, you know, we could, have, we could have you get those numbers from the applicant if you'd like. But uh, just from a, a planning standpoint, it's, you know, those, those are the parking requirements, which they actually do meet um, for the, from the land development code requirements. So. Okay. If you're if you're telling me that they meet the requirements, I'm, I, I, I always have an issue with it. Just because I live, I, I've said it a hundred times. I feel like Carl Holhoff. I live across the street from Gilbert High School, and I've watched the school that only was supposed to house 2,500 kids go up to 3,400 kids, and I watched the traffic come into my neighborhood because of that. There wasn't enough room for all the kids that drove to have an actual parking space on the property. So um, I understand that there's always an issue with when the high school, especially with a high school, because the kids get their licenses during that time, they get cars, and they want to drive themselves. Totally understandable. So there's always an issue for me um, with parking at a high school. Yeah, and th those high schools don't require a traffic impact analysis. Right. <laughs> but I'm trying to head this off at the pass. <laughs> right. <laughs> Thank you, Nathan. Yep. Commissioner Bloomfield? Nathan, this seems like a, a small site for a school. I mean, especially a high school, it seems uh, a bit small. Is it, are they just able to have enough room there just because they're limiting it to 500 students? Is that the, is that the case? Uh, Commissioner Bloomfield, that, yeah, I mean, we essentially, yes. Um, I mean, the, the sites are constrained by development standards. They're constrained by access, circulation, parking, setbacks. Um, the main component of a, of a charter school like this is whether they can handle stacking, parking, drop off, you know, based on the traffic impact analysis and based on a thorough review by our traffic engineering division. So to answer the question, yes, we feel that this site, whether it seems small in number, 7.1, it, it does work for this, for this facility. In fact, I've, um, you know, over the last year or so, we've seen a number of charter schools come in with use permits, and this is is better than most, <laughs> I, would, I would estimate, actually. So, Thank you, Nathan. So we've we've made that. it work before. Yeah. Thank you, Nathan. Any additional questions for staff? Um, I did have a question. Is there, do we know, uh, it looks like they have a small field or retention area. Does that intend to be lit? They... Yeah, um, the applicant responded to that question. Um, it is not going to be lit, and the only events will be maybe once, twice a year, festivals and things like that, but there's not going to be outdoor events in the evenings and there won't be illumination or of those fields or anything. Okay. And then um, I think the second question I raised to you also uh, pertained, uh, this was yesterday, um, but pertained to um, the separation wall between the use and the single family residential that we just approved to the south. Right. Uh, Madam Chair, that's correct. Um, Essentially, you can see on the site plan here that, you know, they, the applicant has worked with the Copper Ranch uh, folks and, and has that overlay of the what the new layout and design will look like of that subdivision. You can see these lots down here, which is the property in question. Um, you know, these lots right here, and they have a probably a better detail than this that they provided, but 
all these individual lots that you see here are going to have walls around them. So they're going to have a theme wall around this. So, you know, for a number of reasons, the applicant and staff felt that leaving this open is actually a good idea and will look better. And, and additionally, it won't provide this 30 foot wide corridor here that's walled off, you know, and creates kind of a, you know, a little bit more unsafe environment um, than, than anything. But, um, you know, again, th these will have walls around them, so uh, it won't be completely open. Okay. And then um, I think generally speaking, as a general comment, I think we have a lot of kids in this area. <laughs> Because if I think about it, within a, probably about a three square mile radius, I think we have seven or eight, maybe nine schools. Um, so I could see how this could be potentially developed and at a smaller level than some of our public schools and public high schools in the, the area. Um, but getting to that, uh, I know that the that they have the school, uh, K through eight, that's located on the southwest corner, and then just about less than a half mile south of this location, there's a middle school, Cooley Middle School. Middle school. Um, do you know, are, are the start and stop times for schools staggered? Are they at the same time? Will this intersection be clustered with thousands of people at the same time? Do we know? Well, I would uh, probably defer that to, I don't know that information. Okay. So I'd defer to our traffic engineer on that. I don't know if he knows, I but. I don't know if he knows either, but. Uh, and we could always ask the applicant. I handle but I do all the times. So. I know Cooley Middle School starts at 9 a.m. My daughter happens to go there. Um, but I, I don't know about your school on the west side, and I don't know what was planned for this particular school. Yeah. Good evening. Eric Kadarian, Town Traffic Engineer. And I, I guess I just have the times from the report, so okay. I'll, I'll just read. Um, I'll read from the report. Um, so the classes for this school are planned to start at 8 a.m. and 8.30. They, they have staggered start times. Um, and dismissal at 3.05 and 3.35. Um, the, the, let's see, the, their school on the southwest corner starts at 8.15. And Cooley Middle School starts at 8.55. Um, and the, the, those dismissal times are at 3.15 and 3.50, respectively. So there's a, there's a large group between 8 and 9 o'clock and, and between 3 and 4, but none of them are at the exact same time. So um, hopefully we, we worked it around as, as well as possible. Okay, great. And I noticed in the staff report um, that traffic has reviewed and approved the traffic circulation plan associated with this proposal? Correct. Okay, great. A lot of times we don't get that, so <laughs> that was a bonus. All right, are there any further questions for staff? Okay, with that we'll go ahead and invite the applicant up. If you can state your name and city of residence. Madam Chair and uh, fellow members of the Commission, Troy Peterson, 1295 West Washington in Tempe, Arizona. So with uh, uh, just a, a brief couple of comments on the, on the uh, CAFA school here, Classics and Fine Arts High School, a couple of the unique features that the school has, and I appreciate uh, Nate saying that it's the, the, the level of detail that, that have, has been looked into this case is is better than most, and having done several uh, schools like this, I would say that that working with the classic and fine arts uh, schools is, is the, the the they're on the top of the list, and I'll explain that a little bit. With me here tonight is uh, Evelyn Taylor, who's the charter holder for the school for both the elementary school on the southwest corner, and also for the the seven through twelve uh, school being proposed here is Robert Via, who's the principal. Of the of the high school, and then and then the the unique the unique factor the differentiator here is Heidi and I'll get your last name wrong, Medajika, who's the transportation director, and a, a key part of of what uh, Kafa and I'll just refer to it as Kafa has been successful at on the transportation side are is is one uh, bus ridership. They currently have at the current high school 40% of the students who ride buses and the more students who ride buses, the better 
transportation and traffic works around the school site, and they actually have their, their trajectory on bus ridership is going up. It's not stagnant or declining, it's going up, and, and they see that continuing to happen. And the, the site has been, the traffic analysis that's been done contemplated that, but then in working with town traffic engineering, the question was, well, what if that goes down in the future? What if, what if uh, another school happens to move in and occupy this facility that doesn't have that same level of bus ridership? And so we, the site plan has been analyzed and set up so that there's, there is queuing in place if that bus ridership is uh, diminished or even significantly diminished in the future that the site still works from a traffic perspective. So there's been a lot of factors of safety worked into the, into the site. On the, the other, the, the coordination as, uh, as was discussed, we, the, the, the school start times with, with both uh, the elementary school, this school, Cooley Middle School, ha have all been coordinated. And it's, it's a dynamic process as well. It's not a, a spot in time. And that's even why it's more, more important that the school has a transportation director because her role is to coordinate these, these start, start, start times and uh, let out time so that so with the other schools in the area and adjust those as needed and in in the traffic study as well when the school w and in the stipulations when the school hits a certain occupancy of, of 500 students that they, they will uh, the the staggered they'll analyze the and implement staggered start times for the school as well to even uh, make the traffic work better every year they prepare a plan submit that to to the town, the town reviews it, and with the, the elementary school that's been across the street, open for a, a year now, it's uh, gone very well from town traffic engineering, no incidents, no complaints uh, as far as traffic uh, from, from the school in that area. So I think what you have here is, is a fairly unique situation for, for certainly the, the bar is raised higher than public schools with the traffic requirement, but even, even uh, top of the class uh, performance as far as transportation design goes and, and considering all these factors that, that have come into place that you have a school here who not only understands the importance of designing the site correctly but also of, the, of ongoing year by year as, as the dynamics of the, of the number of students driving and, and bus ridership and, every, and parent drop off as all that changes year by year. They're there, they're adjusting for it, they're, they're making accommodations, they're working with the town and they're making it work so it's gonna be successful and that's been a recipe for success in the past and, and will be in the future as well. And I'll be happy to uh, answer any further questions. Great, thank you, Troy. Any uh, questions for the applicant? All right, thank you very much, we appreciate your your presentation today. Is there anybody here wishing to speak on this matter? If you could um, please give your, maybe slip to the, those at the table here and uh, um, provide your name and city of residence at the podium. My name is Greg Curryless. Uh, I'm a resident of Gilbert. In fact, I live in Copper Ranch. Um, and thank you for your time, Madam Chair and, and Commission members. Uh, the reason that I'm here is I, I think Copper Ranch isn't being properly represented in this situation. To say that there's been no complaints about the traffic since the elementary school went into place there is simply false. In fact, I've made several complaints to Heidi who is sitting over here. Um, those complaints were, I would say, partially addressed. Um, but many of the situations, uh, the traffic situations in particular, haven't been changed. Parents are still doing U-turns into Copper Ranch. Parents are still using Copper Ranch as a way to cut through and get from Wrecker down Ranch Road and back on to Warner Road. Um, when there was an event last year, uh, parents used Copper Ranch as a parking facility. It's not a parking facility. It's where people live. Uh, and the streets were lined with cars on either end to the point where only one car could get through. It was congested at the stop sign when you came off of Wrecker Road. 
uh, my, H, uh, my HOA is aware of the situation. They've said that they were going to speak with um, the principal over at the school that's currently existing as well as the new school. And my concern is that no one's thinking about the fact that there are residents who live there. There are residents that have to deal with traffic in the morning. 8 a.m. is when I go to work. I can't get out of my own subdivision without worrying about getting hit by someone U-turning. I've made uh, numerous complaints to Gilbert PD, told that they couldn't do anything because there's no stops, there's no sign there that says no U-turn. There's no signage in our subdivision that says no parking. There's no painted curbs. So there's nothing they could do about it. I don't know if that's true. Um, but that's kind of where I'm coming from as a resident of Copper Ranch. I'd like to make sure that, you know, you can say that there's been studies done, but you don't really know until you start seeing. I mean, I, I invite any of you to go sit out there on the corner of Wrecker and Warner in the morning and see what kind of traffic we're dealing with. So adding another school is a concern. Great. Thank you, Greg. Yep. Um, I just have a quick question for you. I noticed um, uh, when you say that there's congestion at events, or is that like parent-teacher conference or maybe um, after-school events, activities? The event that I'm referring to in specific was one that was held in the evening. I don't know what it was. Um, I followed up with my HOA, and they said that they were going to look into it. And I, I don't know what the event exactly was, but it was a... Uh, an event in the evening where they had, I, I believe, rented the, the space that this new school would go into to for parking purposes. The issue was people were pulling into Copper Ranch, parking along the streets, because that lot either filled up. It looked full to me. I don't know if it filled up completely or they just weren't aware where they should have been parking. But my concern is if you put a high school there and there's more events or you simply have high school students, are we going to still use Copper Ranch to cut through there? How are we going to control traffic to keep it away from the actual Copper Ranch subdivision? Okay. Thank you. Yep. Any further questions for Greg? All right. We appreciate you coming down and providing input. Um, does the applicant uh, have anything further to add? To address the issue of the event to start with. Can you give your name? Sorry. Oh, I'm sorry. And My name's Heidi Matajika, and I live in Mesa. Um, that was our very, very first event of the year, and it was a lot more parents than we were anticipating, and we immediately changed our events from then on out and have not had those issues since. Um, we had invited both our high school campus and our elementary campus to join together and realized that made way too many students at that time for that place and so we started staggering those events and that has made it much better so we would continue to do that even with the high school and the elementary school we would obviously need to stagger those events instead of having invited you know both both campuses to do one event so that's how we've addressed that and as far as some of the other traffic issues you know that wrecker road u-turn thing that is that is complicated um, but we have done our best as far as we have sent out letters to all of our parents emails things of that nature requesting that they don't make that u-turn um, because they're not allowed to use warner road as an entrance that is the only entrance into the school so that that's kind of how they have to do that um, but you know since that since he did bring that to our attention, I do think that, that we have been able to limit that quite a bit, that there has not been as many issues as there was at the beginning of the year. So as we learn and grow, we have been making as many changes and accommodations as we can to help the community around us. Great. Thank you. Appreciate your input. Uh, Commissioner Ayler, Vice Chairman Ayler. I have, I have a Sorry. question uh, when it comes to for our high school events and how you're looking at future performances I'm assuming you'll have and are, are you looking at staggering some of that too because I could see I could see uh, 500 students and two parents each and I mean you'd be flooding everything yes well what we had to do is that like I said we learned from that one we had one night one event both campuses since then we have broken everything up we actually have a k3 event a 4-6 event a junior high event a high school event so we break them up by grade level and then we also do more than one night so that allows for you know i only sell 300 seats you know to this event and then that way i know that i've got enough parking spots to accommodate that so we have been been making sure that we sell less and do more nights to make sure that those events are not overwhelming Okay, I, I mean, I just make sure and concern that even at 300, 
and you only have 200 spots, 230 spots. I'm just saying, looking into the future, you might really look at that for high school performances because you'd see a lot, a lot of cars for something like that. Right. Well, and for the, let's say we did have a high school event, we would not have an elementary event, so we would also have all of the adjoining parking spaces across the street to utilize for those things. Thank you. Thank you. Any further questions? Anything further from the applicant? Would staff like to add anything additional? Madam Chair, no, no, unless you have any other questions for us. Okay. With that, we'll go ahead and close the public hearing and bring it back to the dais for uh, discussion and possible motion. Somebody would want to go first? Chairman. Commissioner Peterson. Can I ask our traffic engineer a question? Is that possible? <laughs> Yes. Something just popped into my head um, based on what the resident said. Um, is it possible? I, I know in my neighborhood we did eventually put up no parking signs and we did like a 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. kind of thing because we had so much flood from the high school parking in our neighborhood. Um, is it possible for this neighborhood to get no parking signs on their streets or do they have to go through the whole process of getting the neighbor's permission and everything, is that still the process, I guess, is my question. Commissioner Peterson, it, it is still the process um, because um, they are public streets. We, we cannot say no parking for high school students only, but uh, it, it would be a no parking or no standing stopping restriction for, for all vehicular users. So um, we do have a petition process for a neighborhood to go through. Um, feel free to contact my department. Um, and and we, we do that, and we've okay, done so that around other schools here in Gilbert. But I think for this specific subdivision, we just approved that small lot subdivision around here, and some of their parking was on-street parking that they included in their calculations, so I think it would be really hard to restrict and prevent parking if that on-street parking has been approved as part of their development plan. Whitman, what we've found uh, successful around our high schools especially is we'll only restrict parking from, say, 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. while um, most of the parking in the neighborhood, most of our parking in neighborhood is an issue at night um, or on the weekends. Um, so that, that 10 a.m. to 2 p.m., it, it causes an inconvenience and, and it's a struggle when you have landscapers that can't necessarily park on street. Uh, there are some issues, but but it's, it's quite a bit lessened than, than um, the, the parking issues of the neighborhood. I, in, I think in my neighborhood, the signs say 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. on school days. So it Correct. doesn't even affect if there's the weekends. a holiday or spring break or summer. It's just for specific school days. And that helps a lot. And because it's really regulated by the neighbors, um, they're the ones that would call the police and say, we've had an overflow of cars coming and parking here all of a sudden because school just started. Say, we get that. I get that. And they call the police and the police can come out. They, we know who our neighbor's cars are, so we know who should be there and who shouldn't be there. So it helps a lot. Thank you. And hopefully that can help the resident too. All right. Back to closing the public hearing. Bring it back to the dais. Anything further anybody would like to add? Well, Historically, the chairman doesn't make the motion, so yeah. <laughs> I need somebody else too. <laughs> Well, I mean, overall, um, just as a quick comment, it looks like the school definitely understands the traffic issues that could come out of this and that they have a well-running machine that understands the neighborhood. And hopefully, as they learn through, through this, that uh, they can control their parking. Um, other than that, I think it's well designed. I, I definitely agree that the queuing is way better than we've seen some schools that have come in front of us. Uh, I think it'll the plan is well thought through and it'll move cars through quickly. Um, and, and I'm kind of glad we have something to go back on on the bus ridership. I, I still a little bit on the parking, but I, I think it's well designed. So um, if nobody else has any comment, I was going to make a motion. 
I'll, I'll just follow up real quick with your comment that I think that it's to the benefit of the neighbors that these schools are all um, connected to each other, so to speak, because they can work together. Like was mentioned tonight, they can plan their events, they can plan what days things go on and um, know that they can't hold an event at the elementary school, say, the same night as the high school. Um, so that's definitely a benefit to the, to the neighbors that I hope helps alleviate some of the situation. Great. And then you can have it. Okay, motion, Vice Chairman Naylor. Like, uh, I said a motion of approval for item number 13. Uh, case number is UP 14-02, uh, Classic and Fine Arts High School. Um, uh, subject to this. Subject to the staff report and recommendations. I have a motion by Commissioner Ayler, Vice Chairman Ayler. Do I have a second? Second. Okay, I have a second by Commissioner Powell. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Passes unanimously. Thank you. Uh, moving on to agenda item number 14. I believe we're on now. Um, it's case Z14-02. Oh, thank you. It's a request to rezone approximately 2.3 acres of real property located west of the northwest corner of Ash Street and Vaughn Avenue from Town of Gilbert Heritage Village Center Zoning District to Heritage Village Center with a planned area development overlay zoning district. And with that, we'll invite up Mr. Mike Malillo. Thank you, Chair Whitman. Uh, members of the Commission, case Z1402 um, is a case um, of, for a rezoning for St. Xavier University, uh, a planned area development uh, located at the northwest corner of Vaughan and Ash Street. Uh, the specific request is to rezone from HVC, uh, which is the Heritage Village Center, to HVC with a planned area development, uh, PAD overlay. And the PAD requests um, amended standards in order to permit uh, a five-story building, uh, 85 feet maximum building height, uh, where the maximum height would normally be 55 feet and four stories. All of the other HVC development standards uh, in the code would be met. Uh, looking at the site, um, we are on 2.3 acres located here, uh, this is Vaughn Avenue over here, uh, Gilbert Road running north-south uh, here, and uh, Ash Street uh, is actually, or the what used to be Ash Street, this uh, area is, is just a few months old, uh, but Ash Street used to run at this location. It's actually uh, being relocated immediately adjacent to the site because the public parking structure is being built over uh, what used to be Ash Street. This is the context plan. So uh, Vaughn Avenue here, located on the south, the new Ash Street connection, which is going to ultimately continue north of the uh, power line uh, park and uh, canal here. Here is the public parking structure, which is currently under construction. The orange here represents the building footprint, parking to the north, uh, plaza area located in the center, and uh, uh, this shows uh, actually some uh, circulation connection uh, from the west over to the parking garage. This is the uh, zoning exhibit uh, that has been submitted, and uh, again, this just gives you a little bit more detail. You'll see this again in the site plan of the building placement and the, um, the, the parking area placement on the site. Uh, here is the building concept, and um, this is exactly the same as the graphic that I showed the Planning Commission at the uh, study session uh, in March. 
and, and it really is just conceptual, so this by no means represents the architecture. Uh, the architect for the project is here this evening and is um, prepared to make a presentation and, and answer any questions from the commission. But this basically shows you um, in block form, you know, what we have in terms of first through uh, fourth floor and then the mechanical and roof uh, penthouse located here on the top of the building. Uh, this probably is a little bit uh, more illustrative of floor to floors so you can see why they are requesting the additional height uh, because they basically have uh, a lot of space that they they need between the floors and within each of the floors. So we've got uh, studios on these first uh, two floors. We have a uh, nursing simulation floor here, which is the third floor. Uh, we also have some incubator space on the fourth floor. And then beyond that would be the mechanical penthouse up on the roof of the building. This is a section looking east through the building, so looking towards Gilbert Road. So you can also see here the general assembly use, which would be a, a two-story uh, component, as well as a roof deck on top. Uh, in terms of schedule, um, Town Council is scheduled for May 1st on the zoning. And then um, the design review has not actually been submitted yet. Um, Redevelopment Commission saw this uh, just last week and recommended approval to the Planning Commission for the zoning, but um, the design review submittal isn't expected until later this month, and um, the Redevelopment Commission will most likely review this at their May meeting. The only other thing I'd uh, like to show you is, um, and it was kind of interesting when I was... Uh, pulling this up today, but I wanted to show you just a couple of the uh, graphics out of the land development code that pertain to the downtown area, to the Heritage District. And um, interestingly, this graphic, which was done you know, a couple years ago, pretty much matches <laughs> what the building is uh, proposed here. And, and what this uh, storefront, and this is a storefront and access uh, LDC graphic. So what it's showing here is the minimal setbacks. It's also showing the doorways that we would expect to see every 50 feet with windows. And then, and then this is the transparency uh, graphic, which is also used to illustrate what we would expect to see in the Heritage District um, on multiple story buildings. So um, again, we don't have any architecture at this time, but um, we, uh, we do have the zoning action in front of you. The recommendation is to prove HVC PAD with the amended development standards, recommend approval to the council. And uh, with that, uh, I'll be happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Mike. A um, quick question for you. Do, has, the, has the applicant provided any sort of schematic of elevation to you other than what's been presented tonight? Um, Chair Whitman, no. Um, and, and I think the architect can address why. Okay. I, I just think that uh, many times we receive PAD approvals and not very many times we don't receive the elevations that go along with it. And so it's a little curious um, when we start to review um, exceptions to the code requirements um, when we don't, we don't have the exhibits that go along with it. But we'll invite you up in just one second. Let me make sure there's no other questions from the commission for staff and then we'll, we'll have you address that. Um, any additional questions, Vice Chairman Ayler? Yeah, Mike, can you put up that second uh, paper that you put up there with the elevation? On the, uh, the overhead? Yeah, please. I just needed a quick look at it. So is there, um, I can't tell, it looks like the upper floor is stepped back from the, uh, from the floor in this elevation shot. So there's some depth and it's not a flat 
you have a pedestrian field to the first level and then it steps back a little bit for the building. There's an inset door. I know it's just a schematic, but I'm just saying that's what we're looking for in, in a building. Uh, yes, uh, Vice Chair Ehler, what, what, this is really just looking at transparency issues, but I think it is pretty well reflective of what we're looking for, that and the other graphic on the site plan. We're looking for minimal setbacks, you know, uh, f a minimum of 50% of the building should be within 10% uh, or 10 feet of the property line. So we're talking about minimal setbacks, we're talking about buildings right up near the sidewalk, uh, and we're talking about step backs on the upper levels and um, lots of, um, lots of uh, glass on the building so that we don't have a lot of blank surface area. Yeah, I, I agree. The only thing, and it's all in design, but you got to watch how much glass we get and get reflectivity. But that's all in True. the design of things. I'm just more looking at this and noticing the 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 pedestrian field looks well in the schematic because you're you only have one level, um, first level, and then it steps back. So I just kind of curious of seeing the elevation of the building and in reference to. This, this idea. Thank you. Any further comments or questions for staff? All right, thank you, Mike. We'll invite the applicant up. You can state your name and city of residence for the record. Uh, good evening, uh, Madam Chair and uh, members of the commission. Uh, my name is uh, Michael Crager. I'm an architect with the uh, Smith Group JJR, and my residence is uh, Chandler, Arizona. Well, good evening, Madam Commissioner and uh, fellow uh, commission members. Uh, my name is Rick Carr. I'm with Abacus Project Management. We are the project manager for the project, and uh, my uh, city of residence is Tempe. Um, uh, in response to your comments, we do uh, appreciate your uh, concern and look, uh, wanting to see further on the, on the project uh, as far as the elevations. Um, unfortunately, this whole last month we've been in uh, budget discussions, um, a little bit unique to this project. Um, the development agreement was to establish the budget at 30 percent um, SDs. Um, and we did do an estimate at the end of programming uh, that was not within uh, uh, limits that the university could um, could tolerate. So we had to go into a, a, a sort of a, a redesign or mode looking at the program and uh, looking at ways that we can cut cost. And so we've been doing that the entire month of March, unfortunately. Uh, we just got a sign off from the university today on their portion. Hopefully the town will uh, approve the budget as well so we can move forward at this point. Um, so the um, elevations have pretty much been on hold. Um, maybe a little bit of a benefit of the fact uh, that we were dealing with budget is uh, we've, we've had to uh, uh, make some changes to uh, the initial concept. Um, one, for example, is, is changing, reducing the floor to floor height so we have less skin. So. Um, as far as you know, the 85 feet and the five stories that we're requesting, um, the potential is really high that we'll, we will never get to that point, uh, particularly on the 85 feet. Uh, we'll be below that for sure. Um, in the discussions on budget was the mechanical system and whether we would be able to maintain um, the chilled water system that we were cur currently planning. Um, and that is still the case. Um, but when we presented the project, we did uh, leave the flexibility if we had to change to a rooftop DX system. And that's why we asked for that uh, additional um, space there, that fifth floor, which as Mike has pointed out, is, is really an uninhabitable space. Um, and it's looking very likely that we won't, won't need that as well. So um, does that answer your questions on the elevations? I think so. It sounds like you've had uh, a few struggles um, <laughs> going through this process, um, independent of going through the town's process. Um, 
of course, we, we always like to see what's being proposed, especially when the height is such that this project is. I mean, 85 feet isn't our typical development standard or development that comes through the town. Um, we're excited about it, but we'd also like to see something um, that helps to justify um, the applications that comes through, but understand that your hands are somewhat tied. Um, so I appreciate that. Is there any comments or questions for the applicant from commissioners? I think one of the questions was whether or not you're going to have a straight wall that goes up for the, f the full four stories. We know that the fifth story is going to be somewhat compressed. If it happens at all, it'll be more in the center of the building. Um, but for the four stories, is there going to be is it going to be a, a straight face, or is there going to be some some stepping to it? Commissioner Bloomfield, um, currently we are looking at a, um, a four-story um, block, but we are looking at some articulation uh, on the exterior of the building. Today we were studying some materials uh, for the exterior of it and uh, fenestration uh, components. Uh, we are looking at the first level to be uh, quite a bit of glazing based on the, the zoning. And uh, you can't see in here, but we've got a circulation spine. The uh, section that was shown earlier, I don't know if I can page yeah. This uh, section that was shown earlier is kind of cut through a uh, circulation spine is what we're talking about. And it is... Uh, I don't think the laser's working. This one's my work. But and, and what we're currently looking at is that this is going to become more of a glass enclosure that happens here. Uh, for a 30-foot bay to kind of art articulate the circulation, the main entry into the building. We are trying to bring some glazing uh, along the base, along Ash and Vaughn Street. Um, we are looking at different material studies uh, as far as the general assembly area, um, maybe articulating. We, we still don't know if it's going to be masonry, if it's going to be metal panel, if it's going to be glass, but we're looking at those type of articulations. But to answer your question, we are going to be uh, pretty sh um, much a four-story box, but we're trying to pro provide arc articulation on that to, to soften those edges. Okay. We'll leave that up to the design review oh. board. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> a little I'd... out of our purview, but uh, appreciate the input that you provided. Anything additional that you wanted to? Well, I just going back to hopefully working with the design review board. I, I I'm in downtown Phoenix majority of the day, and we've walked around a lot of the buildings that you guys have designed over the years for ASU, and, and they're well designed buildings. It just I, I I just you know, and it gets back to design review. But downtown Phoenix is one thing. Downtown historical district of Gilbert is another, and taking that style of a mass of a building, bringing it into the historic or heritage district, not historical district, but uh, Close. it's just something in, in in watching that design. So, but you guys deal with that with design review. We understand that there's some challenges with, with the design and the heritage uh, village uh, center, and we're working towards those uh, zoning uh, requirements, and hopefully we can come to a conclusion that everybody will be satisfied with. Great, thank you. Appreciate your comments. Anything further that you'd like to add? I'm just going to make the one point that we are <clears throat> uh, that the full building footprint is not going to be four four stories. Uh, the general assembly space that uh, Michael referred to is uh, there on that uh, north side of the building. So we're already trying to to scale the building down in, in some way, particularly along Ash, uh, and as Michael indicated, uh, definitely on uh, Vaughn will. We'll be looking at the articulation there to make make the building feel pedestrian friendly uh, as much as possible, uh, and to meet the guidelines of the heritage district. So, okay, great. Um, the other thing I would add, as far as uh, getting back on track, now that we we do have the budget, we uh, we, we can kind of set our schedule 
uh, we'll be talking with Maria actually tonight or tomorrow about uh, coming back in and uh, probably doing a work session uh, in May to sort of present the L building exterior and then going for uh, uh, design review approval in June. Okay. okay. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Um, with that, is there anyone here in the audience wishing to speak on this matter? It's pretty sparse, so I don't think there is anybody here. And I certainly don't have any cards. So I take that as a no. Um, I imagine the applicant doesn't have anything further to add. Staff, do you have anything further to add? No, just to point out that it's going to the Redevelopment Commission for design review, not the design review board. Oh. oh. Because the Re Redevelopment Commission is the design review board for the Heritage District. So they approved the land use last month. Is that what happened on the 26th of March? And then the... Yes. And then that, the elevation They approved the zoning recommendation to the Planning Commission uh, last month, and they'll also be approving the design. Okay, great. Thank you. Anything further to add or any questions for staff before we close the public hearing? Okay, we'll close the public hearing, bring it back to the dais for any comment, discussion, possible motion. I'll go ahead and make a motion. If sure. there's no comment, Peterson. then it doesn't look like anybody has any. For the reasons set forth in the staff report, move to recommend approval to the town council for Z14-02, subject to the conditions listed in the staff report. Do I have a second? Second. Who, who said second? You did? I think, I, I don't, who said second? Oh, Kyle. Kyle. <laughs> I'm hearing it all around. I don't know who it was. I wasn't sure. All right, so I have a, a motion by Commissioner Peterson, a um, second by Commissioner Powell. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Passes unanimously. Thank you. Um, I think we have one last item on the agenda, on the public hearing agenda which is case Z, uh, case number 17 on the agenda, Z13-04. It's a request to amend the Town of, of Gilbert Land Development Code. Um, land use regulations for the commercial districts um, relating to adding additional regulations to the residential permanent, fam permanent multifamily use in commercial zoning districts to permit multifamily uses as part of a mixed-use development subject to a conditional use permit in the regional commercial zoning district. That's a mouthful. With that, Mr. Mike Malolo, last time. Got to make a big. Thank you, Chair. No pressure. Members of the Commission. Um, the request is to amend um, Section 2.306, the additional use regulations in the commercial zoning districts. Um, this will establish required findings for issuance of a conditional use permit for multifamily uses in the RC zoning district. Also, um, we'll be amending the glossary of general terms in order to add a new uh, definition for mixed-use development that we currently don't have in the code. Uh, the issue here when we began uh, this text amendment, which, by the way, was about a year ago, uh, well, actually a little bit more than a year ago, we, we had it initiated at the Planning Commission, I believe, in, um, in March of 2013. Uh, as we continue to have developer requests to approve multifamily projects as part of mixed-use developments in the RC zoning district. This has been a provision within the zoning code since the LDC was written in 2005. And um, there is, uh, in 2.303, there is a limitation, L7, which states only permitted as part of an integrated mixed-use plan and a conditional use permit is required. The, the issue with that is that there really hasn't been a good definition of what integrated mixed-use plan is. And so um, what this text amendment seeks to do is to create additional findings that are specific to providing residential um, multifamily use within the RC zoning district. So these, uh, which we've seen earlier this evening, are the actual uh, use permit findings uh, out of um, Article 5.4 of the code. 
and uh, I won't read each of them. Uh, you're familiar with them. They're basically generic use permit findings that there's not going to be a detriment to public health safety or general welfare, and that there there isn't going to be a negative impact on a, uh, adjoining or nearby properties. What we did uh, when we began this process is we formed a stakeholders group um, made up of property owners, developers, uh, the chamber was represented as well as the Small Business Alliance, architects, attorneys, and we had, um, we had at least one planning commissioner, I know, that was at all the meetings. We may have had additional planning commissioners at some of the, the meetings. And um, what we did was we reviewed existing land use regulations. We identified what the problems were. You know, why, why are developers seeking to do multifamily within regional commercial zoning districts? And we found out that uh, you know, developers are looking way for ways to uh, sell off properties within these larger centers, um, uh, add to the mixture of uses. Uh, they found that uh, in today's retailing environment, they're not finding as many retail users to take all of the space that, uh, space that they have available. And so that's why they're looking to mix it up a little bit by adding multifamily components. Luckily, in uh, May of uh, 2010, ASU uh, did an initial study for the town um, and came up with uh, development and design guidelines related to mixed use. Now, this document wasn't specifically related just to multifamily in regional commercial. It looked at multifamily much more globally but how it would apply to the town of Gilbert. So um, what we identified as we went through our stakeholder meetings and discussions was, you know, there really are a lot of benefits to mixing up land uses um, th through, um, you know, mixing different uses together, through putting them together in a compact design, through specifically looking at pedestrian scale and how you make a uh, particular development walkable and comfortable and safe to walk for pedestrians and also how to connect uh, developments. And so uh, we found that there really are multiple benefits from, from each of these major categories and there's also multiple ways to achieve them. So the recommendation from the stakeholders group was to add specific findings to section 2.306 um, and those would be used in addition to the more generic uh, use permit findings that we've already discussed. And then in order to, um, in order to elaborate on those or explain and communicate to people what we mean and how they can achieve those findings, actually put together some mixed-use design guidelines in a separate document which would go into Chapter 2 of the Land Development Code, which is where we keep all of our design guidelines and standards. So two different things, findings and then design guidelines. And all we're really dealing with in this text amendment is the findings part. Finding number one would be mixed land uses, and, and that basically means locating all the different uses, um, stores, offices, residences, you might have some uh, entertainment, recreation uses, some public uses, uh, within walking distance of each other. Um, you may recognize this if you've been um, on the commission for a long time. This is actually a plan that was proposed for this area here in the Civic Center. Uh, and, and so the, the Civic Center is here. And um, this was the, what was the vacant parcel up along Warner Road and Gilbert Road. And here's um, Civic Center Drive. So this was a mixed use proposal that would have integrated residential, with offices and retail, uh, along with the civic uses. So probably a pretty good example of mixed land uses. 
but unfortunately it was never developed. Finding number two, sustainability through compact design. Uh, this graphic really just illustrates, you know, keeping the development compact um, so that there isn't a lot of space that's devoted to large surface parking areas. Instead, you've got gathering places which are, you know, represented by this spine in the center uh, and um, sure, there is some surface parking, but there's, there's probably parking structures um, integrated into this type of a scheme because you just don't see a lot of, of uh, parking on the site, you see buildings. So that lessens dependence on cars and reduces environmental impacts. Finding number three would be pedestrian scale and orientation. And this is pretty self-explanatory, really just creating more of a walkable environment um, so that everything is human scaled, people feel comfortable and safe walking around the project. And transportation and connectivity, um, really just connecting the transportation system to, to efficiently serve all modes of transportation. You know, we live in a fairly suburban environment uh, where almost everything is devoted to the car, and, and this really talks about devoting some space to other modes of transportation. This is the definition that would be added to the glossary of general terms, and, um, you know, we, I think we were very um, uh, careful in how we worded this for the purpose of integrating multifamily into the RC district, the definition of mixed use development is. And the reason we, we put that in there is because as Commissioner Cavani mentioned at uh, your last meeting, there are a lot of other types of mixed use that can probably happen in Gilbert. But for this specific text amendment, what we're looking at really is a mixture of residential with non-residential uses. Uh, this is the, uh, the schedule. Um, hopefully we receive a recommendation from the Planning Commission this evening. The Town Council meeting would then be scheduled for May 1st, and then there would actually need to be a second text amendment uh, in order to add the design guidelines, which would elaborate on these findings into Chapter 2. So with that, I'll be happy to answer any questions the Commission has. Thank you, Mr. Malolo. Is there any questions for staff? I have, I have one. Commissioner Powell. So the uh, second text amendment that's initiated subsequent to the Town Council meeting, does that come before the Planning Commission as well so that we can have discussion about the, the, uh, the uh, standards and guidelines? Yes, Commissioner Powell. That, that will run through the same process. Okay, thank you. Further questions for staff? Um, no? You did? Yeah. Vice Chairman Ayler, I'm sorry. Thank you. <laughs> uh, I mean, it's a very minor comment. I'd like just to thank Mike on this. I know, I know Bridget, and I was at one or two meetings, but you guys put a lot of work into it, and I think we've run through this um, through the middle a few times to make where we're at a lot better than where we started. The only, the only question, and it would probably end up getting tied into the guidelines, is just staying away from um, being able to develop the uh, the apartment side and then kind of phase two and the connectivity. Um, I just think that's something we have to look forward into design that would, because the, the one that was developed or looked like it was going to be developed out on the front here still had a little separation and then we keep getting around how do you integrate horizontally vertically does it work in time um, but I think it's something that we need to look forward into the design standards but I'm, I'm glad where we got so far on this part of the text amendment All right, with that, uh, do any of the other commissioners have anything? Any questions for staff? No? Okay. 
Um, there's nobody left in the audience, so I'll say it just in case somebody's here, but I don't have any cards to speak, um, and I don't see anybody here. So with that, uh, is there anything further that you'd like to add, Mr. Molo, to your presentation before we close the public hearing? No. <laughs> Come on. I need some long-winded It's been a pleasure working with the Planning Commission over the years. Thank you. Oh, thank you, Mike. The pleasure has been all ours. Um, all right, with that, we'll go ahead and close the public hearing and bring it back to the dais for comment, discussion, possible motion. Oh, with that, Chairman, I'll, um, I'll go ahead and make a motion. There was a lot of work put into this, and uh, I appreciate all the time and effort Mike put into it and everything that he's taught me over the years since this is my last opportunity to speak to him since he's standing at the podium still. Um, my motion would be for the reasons set forth in the staff report moved to recommend approval to the Town Council for Z13-04 as requested. Okay, I have a motion by Commissioner Peterson. Do I have a second? Second. Okay, I have a second by Carl Bloomfield, or Commissioner Bloomfield. Uh, <laughs> um, can, uh, all in favor? Thank you. Lost. Aye. 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 Any opposed? Passed unanimously. Thank you, Mr. Malillo, for your last presentation. Thank you. Try not to skip out of here too quickly. Um, moving on to administrative items, we have agenda item number 18, which is our minutes. Consider approval of the minutes of the study session and regular meeting of March 5th, 2014. I wasn't here, so I'll abstain from the vote. I, I was just, uh, for legal purposes, would the only people that vote on this be the three of us that are here on the dais that were present for the meeting? Uh, Chairwoman Whitman and Member Peterson, that's correct. Okay, so myself, Commissioner Powell, and Vice Chairman Ayler would be, and I, I didn't see anything in the minutes, and I would go ahead and make a motion to approve the study session minutes and the regular hearing minutes for 315-14. Do I have a second? A second. Second by Vice Chairman Ayler. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Motion approved. Okay, moving on to communications. Report from chairman and members of the commission on current events. Well, I think the one biggest current event that's with us right now, or before us right now, is uh, Mr. Mike Malillo. Luckily, is retiring. Um, we're all very jealous of your newfound freedom. <laughs> um, but do want to thank you uh, personally for all of your hard work over the years. I'm, I can't remember a time working with the town, whether on the commission or not, when you weren't here. So it's been probably 10 years, I want to say, eight, eight, 10 years. How long has it been, Mike? 12, even longer than I thought. So um, you've definitely made an impact on the town and the way the town views things. And also working as a zoning administrator, I mean, we've worn a lot of hats for the town and we um, truly appreciate all the work, all the hard work that you've put into all the code amendments that have gone through, because you handle those blissfully. I mean, you just, it's amazing the way that you can handle and pull together research and comparative information and data from other cities and present, us, uh, present them to us in a logical way that we can understand them. So we, we certainly appreciate that, and you will definitely be missed. <laughs> All right, any other events, current events? Um, Chairman, I'll go ahead and mention there are a couple events coming up uh, that I'll bring to your attention. Uh, Gilbert is hosting um, USA BMX here for the second time for an open house on um, April 8th from 6 to 8 p.m. here in the council chambers. It's uh, the opportunity for the public to hear and learn a little bit about USA BMX and their potential um, location here in the town of Gilbert. And then also, I think that if our um, liaison were here from the town council, she would mention that there's an Operation Welcome Home coming up on Thursday, April 17th at 5.30 p.m., also here in the chambers. And it's an awesome opportunity to show appreciation for three military veterans from the town of Gilbert. And um, that's all I have. All right. Moving on uh, to report from Council Liaison. She was here earlier, um, but had to leave for some other um, scheduled events. Um, and that leaves us with item 21, which is a report from Planning Services Manager, Linda Edwards, on current events. Madam Chair and Commissioners, thank you. I do want to also thank Mike Melillo. He has been in the industry for 34 years, served many years with Scottsdale, 12 with us. 
And you can just imagine how much he has made a difference in where he's worked. Along with hundreds of projects here in Gilbert, he has managed and facilitated and spearheaded many, many stakeholder groups, text amendments as the town has grown through our new code, and does a great job and has done a great job. And I know that he's not going to stop doing what he's doing. He's just going to um, spread his wings and do it, I think, in a wider breath. So I'm very excited to see what he does as he pursues this second career and part-time work in the industry, because I know he's going to do some great things. Good. That means we might get to see him again, then. <laughs> A couple of other things. Um, I welcome David and Carl um, joining the commission. As you can see, it's going to uh, be exciting as we jump from subject to subject. And um, it's just never boring here in Gilbert. Uh, we have 74 square miles of excitement every month. <laughs> Um, so it's very interesting. I just did notice also that our web page um, provides a new article that we are the number three out of 42 safest uh, community of towns over 10,000. And the mayor's character race is on April the 5th at 7 a.m. at Christ Greenfield Lutheran Church. And the annual Feathered Friends of Festival at the Riparian Institute is a really wonderful um, event, both for learning and um, uh, just family fun, and that is also on the 5th from 9 to 1 p.m. Also, um, we have Catherine Lobert and Amy here this evening, and they are spearheading the Santan Character uh, General Plan update. The first open house is April 16th from 4 to 7 at our South Area Service Center, which is the northwest corner of Greenfield and Queen Creek. We're very excited about the public and the residents and the businesses being part of this update and helping us really understand what we're planning for for the long term and help us set those goals and policies to make it happen. So we'll be getting out postcards and building a website and Catherine and Amy are our main contacts. Um, so we're very excited to use some social media this time around to really connect with our residents. Thank Great. You. That's awesome. Can we, can, we be sent, can we be sent that information, please? Maybe an email with just the date, time, location? That would be great. Thank you. All right. With no further items on the agenda, do we have a motion to adjourn? So, so moved. Okay. Thank you, everyone.